Tonight, the first of five Segment 3 reports on what we have chosen to call Crime Rock. There's a lot of corruption in the mu music business because there's a lot of money in the music business, in records, cassettes, and in live performances. That kind of money attracts all kinds of unsavory characters who don't know much about music but do know a lot about crime. Brian Ross reports. <laughs> These are members of the rock music group Rare Earth, trying to put together the right sounds for a hit song. It's been a long time since these musicians have been able to get together like this and concentrate on their music. Only a few years ago, the group was in real trouble, and some of the members were afraid for their lives. Police say much of the trouble for Rare Earth came from this man, Joe Ulo, a reputed mob enforcer from New York, who moved to California a few years ago and moved into the rock music business. One of his first targets was Rare Earth. In 1969, Rare Earth was on top. Its first album, a double platinum record, selling more than two million copies. The good times, the hit albums, and the big money only lasted for three years. And then, Rare Earth began having trouble paying its bills and traveling expenses. Police say that's when Ulo and the mob moved in. From New York. The members of the group say all they knew was that their manager was making deals with people who carried guns. When a band or a management company a band run into trouble financially, that's when they come in. And they are heavies. And they'll promise you anything in the world and say that uh, we'll give you whatever you need, we believe in you, blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, they have to have a percentage of the business. And I'm talking about loan sharking and all the way down the line. By 1976, Ulo was boasting to his associates that he had taken over a hidden interest in the rock group Rare Earth by providing mob money and mob muscle to take care of Rare Earth's debts. But the mob's backing did little to help the group's music. Rare Earth's records didn't sell well. And the group that had once made millions was almost out of business. Peter Orlbeck, the group's drummer, says he was getting visits at home from strangers who wanted to know if he was hiding any of the group's money. You see, we were six guys that were creating lots of money in which lots of people were enjoying. And we were a motor. And all of a sudden, the motor stopped running. And when a motor stopped running, it started affecting a lot of people. So you don't know what's going to happen. Joe Ulo was arrested last year for the murder of former basketball star Jack Molinas. And police say Members of Rare Earth are lucky no one got hurt. It was a different story for the Three Dog Night, and police also are investigating Ulo's relationship with this rock group. The accountant for the group was shot in the arm and paralyzed in what police believe was a mob dispute over control of Three Dog Night. The group has since broken up, and police are still investigating the shooting. The members of Rare Earth say what happened to them could happen to any rock group trying to make it big in the rock music world. Anybody that makes a lot of money they're susceptible to being come on to by certain people if they run into money problems and if they're not smart enough to handle it all. And that kind of thing can shut down a group? Oh, instantly. Instantly. Because then the group, if a group becomes paranoid of their safety in any way, shape, or form, you can't go to write a song. I mean, it's, you have to have total relaxation and feel good about yourself in order to write good material that uh, people will accept. I mean, it comes through in the music. You can see it, you can feel it, and you can sense it. And ladies and gentlemen, this is Rare Earth. <laughs> After all their troubles, the members of Rare Earth are now trying to make a comeback. This was Rare Earth appearing last summer on the American Bandstand television program. The members of Rare Earth say they are no longer afraid and that they are now free of their past problems. Police say Joe Ulo is out of the rock business and out on bail, awaiting trial for two gang murders unrelated to rock music. Our next report, the mobs move into the rock concert business. Brian Ross, NBC News. Our segment three this evening, part two in a series of five on crime in the rock music business or how in some cities they might but don't advertise a rock concert brought to you under the auspices of a band of hoodlums. There is so much money in it, so many guitar players becoming millionaires in their 20s, gangsters have seen an opportunity and moved in. 
as reported now by Brian Ross. This is Jerry Michelson, a rock concert promoter in Chicago. By the way, you ready for this? This is Arnie Granite, Michelson's partner. Most of Manchester just canceled a whole tour. As rock promoters, they expect yeah. problems. Uh, Last minute cancellations, I'm managers, I'm agents, I'm temperamental I'm rock groups. For the marquee tomorrow night, we cannot fit fabulous poodles across the marquee. But what they never expected was trouble from the mob and that they would have to turn down concerts because of the people involved. And in the summer of 1977, Michelson and Granite turned down an offer to be part of promoting three of the biggest rock concerts ever held in Chicago. This is Soldier Field, and the three big concerts held here were called the Super Bowl of Rock, with estimated ticket sales of well over $2 million, and the biggest names in rock music appearing. A federal grand jury is now investigating allegations that the mob ran these concerts, suspected of bribing city officials to get an exclusive on concerts in Soldier Field, booking rock groups through frontmen, and driving up the price of concert tickets, all part of a huge mob scheme to make big money in the rock concert business. One of the men under federal investigation is Victor Comforti, last photographed 20 years ago when he appeared before the McClellan Senate Rackets Committee. Comforti works out of this heating and air conditioning company on Chicago's west side. A number of rock concert promoters from around the country are believed to be close to Comforti. And federal investigators say this garage has become an important meeting place in the rock concert business. Terry Bruner of the Chicago Better Government Association investigated the concerts. He says Comforti was the godfather of the Soldier Field concerts. He goes way back in the, the history of, uh, of organized crime in Chicago. And I think that uh, it's pretty clear that he was the, the person who was the go-between between the rock promoters and the city officials who were concerned. If you talk to enough people in the entertainment business or the rock business, they're going to tell you that this kind of thing goes on all over the country and that they know ahead of time, look, we're not even going to bother with Chicago. There's too much hassle, as they say. And I think that's a code word for you've got to pay off. And I think that uh, it's pretty clear that these people had to pay off in the city of Chicago. One of the people who says he was a victim of the mob scheme at Soldier Field in Chicago is rock superstar Ted Nugent. Police estimates based on aerial photographs of the crowd at Soldier Field were that as many as 90,000 people were in the stands. But the promoters told Nugent there were only 56,000. And Nugent says he was cheated out of more than $100,000 in his percentage of the ticket sales. You lost a lot of money there, didn't you? Well. Again, you know, it's hard for me to walk away from a gig making a quarter of a million dollars and realize that I lost money. Uh, but yes, the people paid to see Ted Nugent, Ted Nugent should get his money. Doctor, doctor, Jerry Michelson and Arnie Granite say the mob not only came close to putting them out of business, but made them afraid for their lives. And they say it is still difficult for them to put on big concerts in Chicago. They staged this concert in Nebraska a long way from Chicago, and a long way from the mob. You consider yourself an honest businessman? Oh, totally. Do you, though? Yes. yes. Has that hurt you in this industry? Uh, I would say so. I would say that it's definitely hurt us being honest and operating in an honest way. It is difficult. Over the years, there's been times when it's been difficult. We've had to make hard decisions like that. Not to make a payoff, not to skim, not to cheat. Yeah, those decisions have had to be made. There's been easy money out there at times. There was ours for the taking, and we didn't take. In this hall in Nebraska, it is still possible to put on a rock concert without the mob. But in Chicago, and in a number of cities in this country, promoters, managers, and rock stars have to go along with a lot to put on a rock concert. In our next report, the mobs move into the rock recording industry. Brian Ross, NBC News. Another chapter tonight in our series on crime rock. Earlier this week, we saw how organized crime was involved in parts of the rock music business, selling counterfeit recordings, staging concerts, and cheating the performers. But it isn't just men from the mob who add to the problems of the music business. For example, payola. It was big news a few years ago. It may be still be with us today. Brian Ross reports. In the world of rock music, one of the ways to help make a new record a hit 
is to get it played on the radio in Philadelphia. Many of the country's biggest hits were hits first at this radio station, WDAS, Philadelphia's influential and top-rated black and rock music station. NBC News has learned that for the last two years, the Federal Communications Commission has been investigating how records get to be played on WDAS. Among the allegations, that tens of thousands of dollars in bribes were paid to disc jockeys and other WDAS employees. One company that had a problem with WDAS is CBS Records. In 1972, a CBS Records marketing executive wrote a memo to his bosses in New York saying, quote, WDAS AM plays what they're paid to play, unquote. And that was the marketing man's explanation for why CBS Records weren't being played on WDAS. The memo gave specific figures for what it would cost to get a record on WDAS. $200 to the station, $200 more to the morning disc jockey, $100 to one other disc jockey, and $50 to all of the other WDAS disc jockeys for two to three weeks play on the station. NBC News has learned that shortly after CBS Records executives received the memo, CBS Records made payments of $175,000 to companies controlled by two Philadelphia men who had close ties to WDAS disc jockeys. The money was part of an agreement CBS Records had with the men to promote talent and records. After these payments were made, WDAS began playing CBS Records on the air. CBS Records says it does not know how the $175,000 was used. Three years later, all this became the subject of a federal grand jury investigation. When called before the grand jury, CBS Records executive Jack Crago refused to answer questions about WDAS. No action was taken against Crago or CBS Records, and CBS says it has no comment on the case. Crago is now senior vice president of CBS Records. The two Philadelphia men and their companies which did business with CBS Records were indicted. Later, the companies and one of the men pleaded guilty to violations of the federal payola law. At WDAS, despite the FCC investigation, the station spokesman denied that anyone at WDAS took bribes to play records. Is there a payola problem at WDAS? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is not a payola problem at WDAS. Has anyone ever brought to your attention uh, allegations of payments received by disc jockeys at this station to no, pay records? Nothing has ever been brought to my attention or to any other member of management's attention about payola or any offers of payola. The FCC also is investigating the role of WDAS in the promotion of black rock concerts at the Spectrum in Philadelphia and why at least one big rock group gave concert promoters a nice profit by playing here for almost nothing. FCC investigators say this man was one of the promoters. He is Robert Klein, general manager and part owner of WDAS and a key figure in the FCC investigation. Klein would not talk with NBC News. Well, we've, got, we've got some questions we'd like to ask you. Well, you can't do that at this point, Brian. Why is that? FCC investigators say Klein controls what records get played on WDAS. And the investigators allege that Klein has used that control to get big rock groups to play for his concert company. All of the allegations about WDAS will be part of an FCC hearing in Washington later this month. FCC investigators say the WDAS case is just one of many involving disc jockeys suspected of taking bribes to play records. And the investigators say the FCC isn't doing much about payola because there are too few investigators to enforce FCC regulations. The chairman of the FCC, Charles Ferris, says it's up to the Justice Department to prosecute criminal violations of the payola law. Ferris says his policy is to conduct payola investigations only when there is a specific complaint to the FCC. We're just, we're just not going to sit here and say, well, I think it's about time we revved up the payola uh, uh, juices and uh, let's go out on a uh, witch hunt amongst our licensees. I don't think that that is how we should make policy here. So if a disc jockey is taking payola somewhere in this country, there's really not much chance the FCC is going to catch him at it, is there? Uh, by the statistics uh, since 1960, uh, I would say that that's probably uh, uh, a valid assumption. And the facts are, since 1960, when the FCC adopted its payola policies, not one radio station has lost its license because of payola.
In our next report on rock music, the Great Rock T-Shirt War. Brian Ross, NBC News.